Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Alicia and I'm the producer of public programs at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum in New York City. Tonight, in honor of the 80th anniversary of the USS Intrepid's commissioning, we are so thrilled to bring you a very exciting and very rare chance to go behind the scenes with us at the ship and specifically in a very important area called Hangar 2. Now that's home to many historic World War II artifacts and stories and the oldest plane in our collection, the Avenger. Now in just a bit, we will be joined by our curator of aviation, Eric Baim, who will be walking us through the space. And if that wasn't enough, we also have with us tonight our collections manager, Danielle Swanson, who's going to show us some artifacts from deep within our archives. And throughout the program, we invite you to put any questions or comments that you might have in the chat, and we will do our best to get to all of them. But before we jump into the program tonight, a little bit about us here at the museum, if you're not already familiar. This is our ship. Uh, our complex is located on the west side of Manhattan, floating right in the Hudson River, and our museum is housed inside of the historic World War II Essex-class aircraft carrier, the former USS Intrepid. So for some background, the keel of our ship, the bottom of it, was actually laid in preparation for World War II on December 1st, 1941. And then just six days later, on December 7th, Pearl Harbor was attacked, dragging the United States into the conflict and what was estimated to take three years to build ended up taking just 17 months. So our ship began service 80 years ago this month in August of 1943. It was active throughout World War II and the Cold War, and it also played an important role during the space race as a prime recovery vessel for two NASA spacecraft that splashed down into the ocean after their missions. The Intrepid then went on to serve in the Vietnam War on three combat cruises from 1966 to 1968. And then a few years later, it was eventually decommissioned to then later become a museum in 1982 after being saved from the scrapyard. So last year, we celebrated our 40th anniversary as a museum, and our mission remains the same, to honor our heroes, educate the public, and inspire our youth. On site, we've got 28 military aircraft on display. We have the NASA Space Shuttle Orbiter Enterprise. We have a Cold War era nuclear missile submarine, the USS Growler. And of course, the National Historic Landmark itself, the aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid, which is celebrating its 80th anniversary this year uh, since its commissioning. So everyone, without further ado, I would like to welcome on screen here with me, there we go, uh, our tour guides for this evening. So Eric Bain is our curator of aviation at the museum. He served in the U.S. Air Force for 20 years and is a graduate of the State University of New York with a degree in, in history education. Eric has been on staff for over 18 years, managing the care and the refurbishment of our aircraft collection and creates exhibit content and programming. And he's now a grandfather of a very inquisitive three-year-old and is looking forward to inspiring her by sharing his interest in the area of science, history, and aerospace. Also joining us is our collections manager, Danielle Swanson, who oversees incoming donations and artifact care. She manages the museum's online collections database. She organizes loans and assists with exhibition development. She previously worked as the collections manager at the Tenement Museum and has an MA in museum studies from the George Washington University and a BA in art conservation and art history from the University of Delaware. So both of you, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I'm going to pass it over to you, Danielle, to kick us off. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. We're going to be passing back a mic back and forth um, just so you can hear each of us when we are talking. Um, but I wanted to start off by showing you some artifacts from our collection related to the very beginning of USS Intrepid. Um, so if you have a chance to come visit us in person, um, you'll see throughout the hangar decks, we have some really cool objects in our cases. Um, they span the history of the ship and the service years. Um, and it's a chance for us to show artifacts from our collection that are normally housed um, within our collection storage below deck on the ship. Um, but for today, I brought out some cool things. You'll see some other stuff later. Um, but right here, we have a very special artifact. It's probably one of the most important things in our collection, I would say. And this is actually the christening bottle from Intrepid when it was christened in April 26, 1943. You can see here on the ribbon. Um, and the christening was actually when Intrepid was officially named USS Intrepid. Um, there'd be a whole uh, ceremony on that day. And there was a sponsor, usually um, the wife of someone important. In our case, it was Mrs. Helen Hoover. Um, she was the wife of Vice Admiral John Hoover. And so when she christened the ship, she had this bottle. It would have been filled with champagne, and they would have launched it on the bow. 
And so as you can see here, um, it was in some uh, condition, uh, poor condition, but we had it conserved. And all that remains is the top of the champagne bottle here. Um, but it's a really kind of special and wonderful thing to commemorate the christening um, of the ship. And also the ship was launched into the water that day as well. Um, some other things related to that early beginning period of Intrepid. Um, this comes actually from the commissioning anniversary. Um, as Alicia said, we just celebrated the 80th commissioning anniversary last week on August 16th. The ship was commissioned in 1943. And this is actually the very first program from that commissioning ceremony. So if you open it up, you can see all of the dignitaries and people who came um, and the ceremony itself, as well as kind of a little bit of history of the name USS Intrepid. Um, we also here have an invitation to that commissioning ceremony. Um, the one of our former crew members was able to join there with his wife and so that we have this here. So it's a little bit of representation of the archives that we have in our collection. And then I brought out a little small object related to World War II. You might be wondering why is this four leaf clover and what is it? So this is actually an earring. Um, it was donated to us by the daughter um, of a former crew member um, and his name was Arthur Gardner and he had told her that he and some of his buddies on board pierced their ears with this earring right before um, the ship went to the Battle of Truck. And so it was something for good luck and it must have worked because all of his friends who did this survived that battle. Um, so it's some interesting artifacts that we collect, things relating to Intrepid, its service history, as well as all of our other vessels um, at the museum. And I'll bring you this way to show you what our commissioning bell and give you a little bit of history about that. So here we have Intrepid's commissioning bell from 1943. Um, we don't actually know too, too much about these bells or where they would have been um, uh, placed, although we did find a picture from the 1954 cruise book, which is actually kind of like the yearbook for Intrepid. Um, and it looks like that was in the forecastle, which is in the bow of the ship, kind of where the anchor chain room was. Um, and this was being run, rung for New Year's in that photo. Um, we think the bells might have been rung kind of as a way to keep a track of time, being rung every 30 minutes um, on a four hour watch. Um, they could have been used for alarms. Um, but we think this bell was largely ceremonial. Um, and we had one other decommissioning bell that is further down in the museum that if you come and visit us, you'll get to see that as well. Um, I'll pass the mic to Eric because he has a funny story about the... So we just lost the audio. I think if we could tap it one more time, I think we just turned it off. There we go. I think we can hear you now. Okay, you can hear me now. Yeah, go. modern Excellent. technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, both your buds were working and modern technology uh, strikes again and only one. So we're going to pass it back and forth. It is probably going to have a little lag time in there. Uh, but we were talking about the bell yesterday when we we're talking about what we're going to show everybody tonight. And I remembered a story. I did an oral history with a sailor served sometime in the early 60s. And uh, I didn't have time to look it up again today. But he talked about a discipline bell. And there's actually a photograph of the ship that I saw, uh, an aerial photograph looking down on the deck of the ship, the flight deck. And off the catwalk on the starboard side by the catapult, uh, there was a very shiny little object. Couldn't tell what it was in the photo, uh, but he shed some light on that. It was a discipline bell. Uh, the captain of that period, he hung an extra bell off the catwalk. And any sailors that got in trouble, part of their punishment would be to polish the bell for an entire day. And so it was probably the shiniest thing on the ship. But, and in this black and white photograph, there's this little bright dot. Uh, but I got to do more research on that and find the exact period. But uh, what I want to show you before we get into the behind the scenes part, uh, just to show you this model over here, because this is one of my favorite things to show. Um, this is a wonderful model of Intrepid during World War II, uh, kind of the way she would have appeared in uh, you know, early, mid-1944. 
And uh, I just I just love this because there's a lot going on. One of the things you'll notice right away is it's just covered with guns. Now I'm, I'm looking at lots of airplanes on the deck getting ready to go. Hellcats, the uh, Hell Diver, and Avengers, of course. But all the guns, there's five inch guns, there's 40 millimeter guns, and there's lots of these 20 millimeter guns, and they just ring the ship. Uh, and that is for anti-aircraft use. And uh, one time I was showing a young visitor the ship, and he noticed that the hull of the ship is painted in kind of funny colors. You'll see a shade of uh, very, very dark gray, almost black, a medium gray, and a light gray. And it's all kind of broken up into different shapes. And he wondered what that was. And I told him, that's the camouflage uh, that the ship was painted in. And he immediately said, how is that going to hide a ship? out in the middle of the ocean in broad daylight. A little smart aleck this little guy was. And I, he was thinking of camouflage as uh, uh, more traditionally uh, hiding something. You wanna hide something, you cover it with, a, with netting and grass and trees and stuff and you hide it. But there's other kinds of camouflage. There's mimicry camouflage. Uh, maybe you've seen a walking stick. It's an insect that looks like a stick or that uh, moth that when it lands on a tree, it looks like a face of an owl. And so nobody wants to mess with an owl. So this moth survives by looking like an owl. But there's another kind of camouflage and that's deceptive camouflage. And uh, the way I like to describe it is think of a zebra out on the Serengeti, those beautiful stripes on a zebra aren't just for pretty. They are really serving a purpose. When a lion gets hungry and he starts chasing a zebra, the zebra, watch these movies, uh, will change direction very quickly. And the stripes on the zebra will help disorient the focus of the lion. And that's what's going on here. So what we're protecting from, this camouflage is not protecting you from airplane attack, but it's protecting you from submarines. Now picture a submarine commander and he raises his periscope because he wants to stay underwater and hide. He doesn't want a trap and shooting at him. And just his periscope comes up out of the water and he sees the ship. He's got to decide what's going on here before he can fire a torpedo and try to sink us. He's got to know what direction the ship is going, how fast it's going. And it's, it's very important to kind of uh, think about direction because it could be coming at him. It could be going away from him. The speed of the ship has to be known and the heading of the ship. All those things, it's all math. And he has to figure out a solution because he has to fire the torpedo where the ship is going to be, not where it is. And so this splinter camouflage, the dazzle scheme as it's called, will confuse that guy in the submarine looking at it. And that's what it's for. So I humbled that little visitor. And, uh, but it's a really fun story to talk about dazzle camouflage. But what we're gonna do is gonna get a little more behind the scenes and we're gonna go down to our Avenger and we're gonna take a look inside the airplane. Well, come on down. Now, uh, our Avenger, is a, a wonderful airplane built in 1945. Our actual airplane uh, never got into war. It did not see combat. It was built too late. It was at the end of the run, uh, but it survived. And many, many Avengers have survived to this day. There's plenty of them out there flying, and there, there's a good reason for that too. So let's get a little closer, Jason. So originally designed by Grumman in Long Island, it was called the TBF. That's toward Torpedo, bomber, and F for Grumman, believe it or not. Uh, the G was already taken by the Goodyear company. Um, the TBF uh, originally debuted and rolled out on December 7th, 1941. And that date rings a bell, right? Because that was Pearl Harbor. So uh, there was a naming contest for the airplane and somebody came up with a really great name because of Pearl Harbor, let's call it the Revenger. Ah, uh, that's not a word. And so uh, Avenger was a much more fitting name for this airplane. Uh, the pilots had a lot of disparaging names for it because it was a big tubby kind of thing. Some of them called it the turkey. Uh, but it, I think it's a beautiful airplane and I have personal reasons for that. I can get into that more of that later. Uh, but this is uh, my father uh, went to war in one of these things as a turret gunner. And we're gonna take a closer look at the turret later. Uh, but the design is just very functional. It was made to carry 2,000 pounds of bombs or a 2,000 pound torpedo like you see under the, the body there. Now, one of the things about the, uh, uh, the TBF Avenger, uh, this model is actually a TBM. 
and the reason for the change in the letter, M stands for General Motors, Eastern Aircraft Division. You're thinking General Motors, isn't that Chevrolet? And it is, and it was then too. But after the war started, they were not making cars for the civilian market anymore. All automotive industry, Ford, GM, what have you, they were making military equipment. Ford was making four engine bombers for the Air Corps, but General Motors was tasked to make the Grumman product, the Avenger. But after it was uh, uh, transferred over to them for construction, because of the Navy system that was used until 1962, you get the letter M instead of the letter F. What's really unique about this airplane is all the ordnance, uh, the heavy stuff was carried inside and you could see the bomb bay doors here. Uh, they're double hinged, really a wonderful thing. Everything in all 2000 pounds of ordnance can tuck up inside, keeping you aerodynamic and helping you with uh, speed. It wasn't a fast airplane, cruising speed a little over 200. It could be, it could push 300, uh, but it wasn't a fast airplane, but it could carry a lot of stuff. Real unique feature before we go inside, I wanted to show you the wing fold. The wings are very different on this. The Avenger had over a 50 foot wingspan. We still only have about inside these carriers, about 16 feet of useful height. Airplanes were folding their wings like this. It was very common to fold your wing like this. When you have a 50-foot wingspan airplane, this is probably not going to work. Leroy Grumman had already worked out this very unique geometry of folding a wing back along the fuselage. Uh, he used it on the F4F Wildcat fighters and then on the Avenger and soon to follow the F6F Hellcat. And uh, good thing I mentioned the Hellcat because uh, the reason General Motors was building these things is after the war started, the U.S. Navy told Grumman, we want 12,000 F6F Hellcats, and we would like 10,000 of these TBF Avengers, and one factory in Long Island wasn't going to handle it. So the, uh, the F6F construction stayed out at Bethpage, and then uh, the Avenger construction, the final assembly, moved down to Trenton, New Jersey, just over, over the river and down the, down the road. Uh, there was also some component uh, places around the country that made components, but all that final assembly would end up down here in Trenton. Uh, I'm going to have Jason hop over the fence, and we are going to uh, take a look inside. Now, I mentioned that uh, Avengers, uh, a lot of them survived, and a lot of them survived for good reason. This is a really sturdy airplane. It was made to be sturdy. The Grumman Ironworks made a great airplane. They could take a beating and keep on flying, but it's a very sturdy airplane. It can carry 2,000 pounds. But after the war ended, the Navy continued to use them as uh, what's called carrier onboard delivery or COD. Uh, you could take the turret out, which was several hundred pounds of weight you didn't need, and you could put more seats on the inside. Uh, and you could carry mail and passengers out to the carrier at sea. Uh, when the Navy was actually finished using Avengers and the Avengers were considered obsolete for military use, uh, once they were retired, uh, one really great thing was thought about, and that was firefighting. Take that turret out, you take all the military equipment out of this, you take those double hinged bomb bay doors out, and you put a big old hopper tank under there, and you can carry water or fire retardant. And these made marvelous fire bombers. Uh, lots of them were used in Canada uh, up until just a few years ago. And uh, some of them were used here in the United States. And that is the story of this airplane. It was originally purchased by a man in Tennessee in the 1950s. And he did the conversion into a, a fire bomber with the, uh, uh, the retardant tank installed. Uh, later on in the early 1960s, the state of New York up in Albany, they had the need for an airplane to do such thing to fight fires in the Adirondack area of New York State. And so they purchased the airplane and this airplane served with the state of New York until 1976. And they used it as a fire bomber. They also used it as a photograph uh, airplane. Uh, I have the log books on this airplane. And it, it, it pretty much mapped almost the entire state of New York over the course of a few years. Uh, a lot of missions of just mapping the state. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And then there's one entry in the logbook, which I found completely fascinating. And I did talk to somebody about this story. Uh, they actually experimented with this airplane for stocking fish in a lake. And you're thinking, how are you going to do that? So they were experimenting using little bluegills. And instead of fire retardant in the tank, you had a tank full of fish. And uh, they had to experiment with altitude and speed. And if you drop the fish in their water and that kind of fell all together, the fish wouldn't even know it, that 
big old pill of water with the fish in it would enter the water and you, you would lose very few of them. But you had to have the speed and altitude just right. If the water broke apart and the fish separated from the water, they were going to hit the surface of the lake like a, like a sidewalk. It's not going to be healthy for the fish. Uh, it was deemed kind of impractical. And uh, now that today they do it with helicopters, which you can slow down, hover, get real close and very gently drop the fish into the lake. So we're going to take a look inside. And uh, Alicia, if you could pop up, there was a photograph of uh, the inside. Now, this is where this is a three man crew on the Avenger. You had the pilot, you had the gunner up in the turret. If you, you can look up and see where the turret was and this compartment where we're looking, this is the radio men's compartment. And that photograph will actually show where the equipment and a little folding seat on the left side of the airplane for the radio men. Uh, so he had the job of operating the radios, navigating back to the carrier after a long mission, and also uh, helping the gunner above him in the turret reload magazines into his single 50 caliber machine gun. And so he was pretty busy down there. The, the hot Casings of the uh, of the spent bullets uh, went into a bag, and if the bag ripped, uh, that poor radio man had hot brass uh, falling down on him. And the reason I know this is because uh, stories from my dad and uh, one of his best friends for the rest of his life was the radio man he flew with, and uh, lots of stories from those guys. Now, what I'd like to do, you notice there's a lot of stuff missing, and it is missing because all that military equipment was removed. So this airplane can do its fire bomber role. Uh, what I'd like to do is show you the cockpit. So uh, I'm going to climb up in there. Uh, Jason, no unflattering angles on the camera. And then uh, he's going to follow me up. And as we come up, uh, you'll notice there's lots of hand holes, little, little spring loaded doors. You can main air, maintain aerodynamics. And, and put your foot in things and handles. Uh, you'll notice an access door right here. Uh, this is the life raft compartment. It's actually a tunnel with a door that matches on the other side. So no matter what side of the airplane you exit from, you have access to your life raft. Okay. How's that? Is this a good angle, Jason? Yeah, good. All right, so you can take a look inside. Now, I know uh, you're looking at their pretty cheesy rope uh, situation here, but this is the best way, really. We have to keep the stick from moving and the rudder pedals from moving because of the uh, display cases at the tail of the airplane. If I was to grab this stick uh, or, or, or actuate the rudder pedals, we're going to damage the airplane. So I know it looks a little cheesy, but uh, nobody climbs up here and looks at it anyway. We don't let visitors climb up into the airplane. This is this is a, a behind the scenes. A uh, very basic instrumentation. You could see airspeed indicator and uh, altimeters and um, pop your light on. There we go. And it's just very basic. If you're a pilot, uh, this is all very familiar to you. Engine instrumentation, the radio stuff, hydraulic stuff. Uh, over here, your flap lever, landing gear, uh, throttle mixture and prop setting. And right underneath me here, you have the arrestor hook. You have rudder trim, pitch trim. It's all very, very simple. Remember, the young men flying these things were probably in their early 20s. Uh, and this airplane from the pilots I talked to was a joy to fly. This thing had a lot of wing area. Uh, it had uh, plenty of power. It wasn't the fastest thing in the world, but it had plenty of power to haul you around. And uh, the pilots I talked to that flew these things, once they dropped the fire retardant in those days, boy, was it light. And uh, it really was uh, flew like a hot rod. Okay, I want to be cognizant of time. Uh, let's, let's climb down. Okay, so while I'm up here, I'll point out a few more things. Like, uh, this is the turret, the gun turret. You, I want you to kind of remember where this is on the fuselage. You're behind the pilot, behind the cockpit. Uh, there's still some glazing here. Uh, there is a jump seat 
here, but that is not a regular cruise station during combat. You had a gunner, a radioman down below, and the pilot. But just kind of remember the look of this configuration. Now, when I arrived here in 2005 and I saw this airplane, I was very happy to see an Avenger because of the stories my dad told me when I was a kid. But I was very disappointed to see that there was no guts in it. And it was uh, doing that research uh, that uh, I, I found out about its fire bomber career. And that's why things like that don't exist. So uh, what I'm going to show you next is the guts to the turret. So... Um, it took me three years to collect the parts for that turret, and it's almost complete, but it's really fun to look at. I'm going to have Jason swing the, swing the camera over and look at the bottom of the wing here. Uh, this version of the Avenger was called a, a TBM-3E, and the E was because it was capable of some electronic equipment. You can see electronic cannon plug here and some mount holes. This thing could carry a pod on this wing, that was used for surface search for shipping to find targets. So there was a really nifty little radar pod that can go here. And then in this area here and here, uh, there was uh, attachment points for these little three and a half inch diameter uh, rockets. And they were unguided. You had to point the airplane uh, to get them to fire. And they, uh, they kind of flew a little crazy sometimes, but these rockets were very effective against ground targets. Other than the uh, 50 caliber up in here, the pilot was able to uh, use 50 caliber machine guns, one in each wing. And when we go around on the outside, I'll show you where those were. The first Avengers, the very early model TBFs, uh, had a 30 caliber machine gun down for in the, in the belly here for the radio operator to use. And it, it would uh, protrude right here. And uh, it was found 30 caliber, too small. It didn't have very low, the muzzle velocity wasn't good. It just wasn't a good caliber for air to air fighting. And plus he had a very limited uh, range of motion and a very small uh, viewing space. It was kind of worthless. It was kind of like dead weight. So the, the 30 caliber was deleted from later models of the Avenger. Uh, so we're going to go back out over the fence and uh, we're going to go take a look at that turret. Come on out here. Let me hold that for you. Yeah, I get to hold the camera. I'm the cameraman. I'm the camera. If you want to know what Jason looks like, that's him. <laughs> here you go. We got this really wonderful uh, Wright 2600 14-cylinder engine that gave you like 1,700 horsepower. That's what hauled this airplane around on the three-bladed propeller. Um, it's a very reliable and wonderful engine. And... Uh, powered a lot of airplanes, and there's still some in service today. Uh, what I always find interesting, uh, if you look on the floor, there's a little drop of oil. This airplane ha engine has not run probably for 40 to 45 years, and every once in a while, a little drop of oil uh, ends up on the floor. And I always, uh, I don't mind cleaning that up because it makes me think that the airplane is still with us, is still alive. You come around here, you can uh, see maybe better on this side, the geometry of that wing fold and how the wings fold back. Uh, Leroy Grumman, there's a very famous story uh, about a little pinky eraser with two paper clips in it. And that's how he determined the angles and the geometry of this very unique folding wing system. Uh, it was used on those three Grumman products I mentioned. And also, um, on the E1 Tracer, which was a Grumman product, you know, in the late 50s. And we have one of those on board too, but the same type of, of wing fold. Uh, I mentioned that the pilot had access to uh, firing 250 caliber machine guns. You notice that little bulge right there. That's where the breach of this thing would have been in it. It fired through a hole right here. There's one on each wing, um, forward firing only. And you can see where the uh, ammo could be loaded here, all the fuel was in the main tank that the pilot was sitting on, essentially, in the center wing. Some nifty uh, airframe before we look at the, uh, the turret. Um, I, I always like showing people this. This is called a fixed slot. It's an aerodynamic feature. I really can't do it. You can look down in there. This is a slot in the airfoil. When the airplane's going real fast, boundary layer air 
will uh, reduce drag. It'll it'll flow right over this. It's it's mainly comes into function when the airplane slows down. The air will then work its way through the slot, adding lift at a very critical area, and that's the wingtips, because this is where an airplane wing stalls first out at the tips. So you get better low speed performance with this fixed slot. Another nifty Grumman invention, uh, uh, Grumman invention that showed up on a few of their products. Back here, uh, let me show people the, uh, the cable that is holding the wing in the folded position. When, the, when there's power on the airplane and hydraulic power, the wings fold back and they will stay back. But when the pilot turns the, uh, the engine off and, and the systems all turn off, the wings could bleed down and then the wings will droop. And you don't want that. So there's a little compartment right here. You'll see these little wing nuts on Zeus fasteners. These are quarter turn fasteners. You snap that open and inside there is a reel with a cable. The cable pulls out on the spring loaded reel and you hook it on an eyelet that's built into the horizontal stabilizer. Another thing that's real important to Avengers and anything that flies off of carriers is the arresting hook. And of course you could see that there. And that's for uh, snagging the cable when you land. Okay, we're gonna make our way over to the turret. All right, I think we're right on time. Okay, like I mentioned, uh, my dad, 17 years old, and uh, I, pardon me for telling a personal story, but this one's really meaningful to me, and it kind of tells the story of this stuff. But he was, uh, uh, right before his 17th birthday, he took a class trip. He grew up in New Jersey, and uh, he saw Avengers being built by, uh, by women in the factory. And uh, he always, you know, he was chomping at the bit, like most young men were, to get into combat and serve their country. And it dawned on him that this might be the fastest and best way for him to make a, an impact on the war. And he wanted to be in this thing. And this is that ball turret. And this is uh, about 95% complete. Like I said, this took me about three years collecting parts from all over the world. And uh, I found the man up in Massachusetts. Uh, his name is Harlan. Thank you, Harlan, if you're listening. Uh, he helped assemble it all. He made the plexiglass for us to replace the plexiglass, but all the framework, all the metal on this is original. There's probably uh, pieces and parts of a dozen turrets to make this one. But if you wanna look at some details at, on this, there was, uh, you could see the seat in there, and you can see about where the pilot's head would be. And uh, my dad was almost uh, stone deaf in the left ear. And he couldn't hear a thing, but that's where that breach of that 50 caliber machine gun is. Uh, right in front of his head there, you'll notice that there's a little black box on that green thing with the data plate. Uh, that is an electronic gun sight. That kind of helped the, the gunner lead his target. Now, Dad told me the story that uh, they tried him out at a skeet range. And if these guys uh, could prove themselves in leading a target with a shotgun shooting at uh, clay targets, they had a chance of going to aerial gunnery school. At aerial gunnery school, you had to graduate top in your class in order to pick the airplane you would fly in. He definitely wanted to be an Avenger. The other uh, airplane that the Navy was feeding gunners into in great numbers was the SP, SB-2C Helldiver. And we saw models of that over there on the carrier model. At the time, the SB-2C had a horrible reputation and nobody wanted to go fly on that thing. Uh, it was a difficult airplane to master. Uh, they did eventually figure it all out, but it was a it was deemed as a dangerous thing for air crew. He wanted the Avenger, mainly because it was a New Jersey airplane to him. Uh, also inside, you could see if the electronic gun sight fails, there's a little ring and pipper called iron sights. Uh, the, the ring is on the inside of the bulletproof glass frame, and the pipper is, uh, you could see, on the outside. The handle you see with the button in the middle, that is the main control. That does everything. Every, the, 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 Slewing the turret, which can, it swings uh, 360 degrees nonstop. You can keep swinging in a, in a circle and, and also elevates. And when the gun elevates, the entire seat and all the guts of this thing elevate with it. So when he's shooting straight up, he's laying on his back. And it will shoot almost straight up, 85 degrees up and 30 degrees down, just using that one handle. And there are some manual handles in there. If you lose electricity, you're able to crank it with a, a manual handle, but this was 
at the time this turret came out, this was revolutionary. And uh, so let me show you some other things around this side that made it revolutionary. I, met, I mentioned that it swings 360. It runs off of the power generated by the airplane, but it, it, it wasn't hardwired in. The power came up, and you'll see these two black cylinders right here. Those are called amplodynes, and it needs a lot of power. It needs more power than the aircraft can really generate for the turret. So the amplodynes take that electricity and boosts the voltage and gives it enough power to be independently uh, powered. Uh, now I mentioned that it goes 85 degrees up and 30 degrees down. And if you remember, I said, make note of where it's sitting up there. Uh, with that kind of 360 motion and up and down, it is very easy to shoot off your own wings and shoot off your own tail. And so there was a way to avoid that. And this was the last item I found. I found this on eBay. The person selling it thought it was a part of a hand washing machine. Uh, but it's this barrel thing you see down here in the frame with some gears around it. If you notice on the barrel, and we have this thing in a display case now, uh, so I can't touch it or, or spin that barrel. But there's little raised areas on that barrel in the shape of the wing and in the shape of the tail. And what would happen on this side, there's a little, uh, what I haven't found yet, is an electro electronically controlled micro switch. And when you were slewing the gun around, if the muzzle was pointing at any part of your airframe, and if it was rigged properly, this, uh, the button on the barrel uh, would actuate the switch. And that micro switch electronically shut off the firing mechanism. So if you can imagine you're sitting in the turret and you're shooting at an enemy airplane behind you, but then your tail appears as you slew past the tail, the gun will stop firing. But of course, you're still moving. And when the airplane reappears, the gun will resume firing, theoretically. Dad told a story about putting a bullet right in the leading edge of the vertical stabilizer because this wasn't rigged properly. There's some adjustments to be made. Other things you could see, you could see the very heavy metal plate uh, for uh, uh, armor plating. Uh, we had that armor plated glass. You see the muzzle of the 50 caliber uh, protruding here. It's off to the one side. Uh, if you look just below where the muzzle, where the, the barrel of the gun is coming out of the turret, you'll see two little round uh, pegs coming out. There's two more micro switches there. And if you remember where uh, I, I showed you where the turret is on the uh, fuselage, if the gunner is swinging towards the front of the airplane, it's very easy for that gun to hit that canopy glazing. So what those switches do, they actually have a little metal piece that's, that I have not been able to find, but a, a little metal attachment goes on those two uh, pegs that rides along the skin of the airplane. And as you slew forward, it actuates those two micro switch. One will shut off the firing mechanism and the other micro switch makes the gun go automatically into the 85 degree up. So as you're swinging around the front of the airplane, the gun will get out of the way, stop firing, and then come back down as you resume around the clock. So that's our turret. Now I gotta, I gotta watch our time. How are we doing there? How are we doing on time? All right, we're right on time, actually. Uh, what I want to talk about now is uh, kamikaze. I'm going to turn it over to Danielle. I'm going to, we're going to switch microphones. All right. Can you hear me, Alicia? Yep, you are all good. Awesome. All right. So here also in the hangar deck, um, we have an exhibit um, about the kamikaze attack that took place um, on the ship during World War II. So um, Intrepid was actually attacked four different times by kamikazes and uh, experienced one near miss. And so in our exhibit, you can learn much more about these um, on board. I do want to uh, point out that we do feature kind of the Japanese perspective. We graciously from on loan from the Chiron Peace Museum have a reproduction of a diary um, from a kamikaze pilot. So it kind of just talks about um, the things they're thinking about as they're preparing for these missions that they um, were set to go on. But I've pulled a couple more items from collection storage relating to um, the kamikaze attacks on board. 
Um, so first, uh, we have this metal fragment here. And as you can see, I'm wearing gloves um, because this protects the object. Um, this came to us from Edward Winfrey. Um, he was injured in a kamikaze attack in 1945. Um, his daughters told us that um, the piece of metal was actually lodged in his hip. And so he had never actually wanted to speak about that. As you can imagine, it was probably very traumatic. Um, and so it was only until his later years that he shared this story with them and they finally figured out why he had kept this um, uh, in his home and then later donated to us. Um, we also had recently been donated these two fragments, as you can see with the Japanese writing. Um, we recently had them translated as part of a project you'll get a sneak peek of in a few moments. Um, but we found out that these are actually manufacturing data plates from a Japanese aircraft. Um, this was from the attack on April 16, 1945. And so this uh, identifies that it comes from a Japanese Type 21-0. And this larger piece would have been affixed to the body of the aircraft. And the smaller piece would have been affixed to the engine. And so a lot of these fragments that we have now been donated to the collection are things that um, former crew members would have picked up um, kind of as a souvenir as that might be from, you know, the trauma and things that they experienced during the war. Um, within our exhibit, we talk about one uh, former crew member who tragically lost his life during the kamikaze attack, um, Dominic DiMarzo. He was the Intrepid's fire marshal at the time. And so on November 25th, um, a kamikaze struck Intrepid and he and his crew rushed into the hangar deck here to start fighting fires um, because we were fully loaded. There was a chain reaction within the aircraft in the hangar deck. And so they tried to start putting out the fire. Unfortunately, a few minutes later, another kamikaze crashed into Intrepid as well into that area where they were fighting these fires. And he and most of his crew um, were unfortunately killed. Um, after he was posthumously awarded his Purple, uh, purple Heart, um, as well as the Navy Cross. So his Purple Heart is on display in this case here. Um, but I also brought out his Navy Cross, just so that you can see another of the awards um, that were given to people. Um, and this Navy Cross kind of uh, transitions well because there's another story about um, a group of sailors who had to fight to receive their Navy Cross. Um, this is uh, told on our um, Bloomberg Connects uh, digital platform, but the story is of Gun Tub 10. And so a gun tub, as Eric had pointed out in the model earlier in the ship, they were along, these 20 millimeter guns were in tubs along um, the side of the flight deck. And so the very first kamikaze attack um, struck a uh, gun tub 10, which was prime, which was manned by a group of black sailors. Um, and this uh, was a practice during World War II the um, black sailors were only allowed to serve as stewards, where, which meant they cooked and cleaned for officers on board, as well as in these gun tubs. So that kamikaze struck there and killed nine men. Um, the rest of the men stayed in their position and rushed and stayed there as the kamikaze was coming towards them. Um, in a ceremony after this attack, the uh, Intrepid's captain had awarded some of these surviving men the Navy Cross. But later, the Navy downgraded their medal um, to the Bronze Star. And so you can see um, here, we have a little bit more of the history of their story, as well as, as I mentioned, on Bloomberg Connects, you can learn uh, how they fought to regain those medals um, and, and talk about you know, segregation within the Navy at that time um, and some, some of the hardships that other sailors on board faced. Um, but Eric, I'll turn it back to you if you want to talk about a sneak peek. And actually, really quick before we do that, um, I just want to mention that thing she mentioned, Bloomberg Connects. Uh, so we actually have this wonderful project that we got a grant for called Full Muster. Uh, and it is all about connecting with other naval ships across the country to share a bunch of these different stories about kind of these underrepresented um, you know, people that serve. So we have this wonderful app um, that tells a lot of these stories, as well as a lot of other information about our ship itself. Uh, and if you're interested, you can actually scan the QR code that's on your screen right now um, or go check it out uh, on our website, too. There's a link that I will put in the chat. 
Uh, but right now we are heading over to a, a very, very special sneak peek, uh, something that hasn't even opened yet. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it back on over to Eric. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great, great. All right, so we kind of knocked around the idea of showing you a sneak peek of this, and uh, we've kind of waffled on it, but it's really, really a really cool story. Uh, about 1997, uh, the Japanese outside of Sakai City, Japan, on the island of uh, the, the southern island of uh, Kyoshu, I think it is. I, I, I might be pronouncing that wrong. Uh, but a fisherman snagged something, and he didn't know what it was. When he brought it to the surface, it was an airplane engine with a propeller. Uh, a local archaeology club uh, went out and dived in the area, and what they found uh, was the remnants of a Corsair. And they brought up another fragment, a piece of wing. So they had an engine with a propeller on it and a piece of wing. Um, and uh, it, Jason's taking a sneaky look in there. Uh, <laughs> so that was in 1997, and they really didn't know what to do with it, but they did a lot of research. And their research... Uh, came up with the conclusion, uh, we're not 100% sure, but we're really close to 100% sure, that this was a Corsair that flew from Intrepid in March of 1945, and a young pilot lost his life that day crashing into the bay outside Sakai City. Uh, fast forward the uh, 2017, the Japanese, we didn't know anything about them having these fragments. Uh, in 2017, the Jap 2017, correct? Uh, the Japanese contacted us and said, uh, we have these. It's a Corsair from your ship, and we would like to return them. And we were just stunned, flabbergasted, and, and we had to look into this a little deeper. Uh, so we wanted these parts to come. Uh, the Navy uh, History and Heritage Command, archaeological branch, uh, the underwater archaeology, archaeology branch down in Washington, D.C., uh, accepted them. Uh, they could not be shipped directly to us. They have to go to them to be processed. Then the pandemic hit and everything was slowed down. Uh, but eventually, uh, earlier this year, these parts, which left the deck of Intrepid, and this is the way I think about it, that young man folded those wheels up in 1945 in March, and that airplane did not return until 2023. And it's, but it's back and it's here. And uh, it was going to be more of like a science project. It was going to be talking about the preservation of objects that come up from underwater. It's a very involved process in preserving these things so that they can be used as uh, learning tools for future generations. Plus the research that has to go into them and try to determine what they are and who they were attached to. Uh, and that's pretty much what it was until January of this year when we discovered that this young pilot actually had living relatives uh, that we could talk to. And one thing led to another. I'm not going to give too much of it away, but this uh, photograph, uh, this is the construction wall. This is not part of the exhibit. This will come down when the exhibit opens. Uh, but this young man in this picture is the pilot of this airplane. And so it's been all very moving. Uh, talking to the family, they're, they're just uh, so happy and shocked and amazed. It's been a very emotional ride. Everybody who's worked on this project said it's been the most emotional thing we've ever done here in Intrepid. And it's all because when you find family and the family still cares about that relative, it's just an amazing thing. And they also had a lot of artifacts, a lot of uh, personal artifacts that belong to him and letters that he wrote. He wrote a letter talking about his first flight in a Corsair. It's amazing. I don't want to give away too much. Uh, this is the Corsair. This is actually a, a Corsair from his squadron. Uh, we're still researching to find out which number airplane he was actually in when he was lost. But VF-10, this is the markings of VF-10. This is his squadron. Uh, so if you come around this side, uh, we're not going to go in. We're not going to go look at the actual objects. They are actually in, uh, uh, I hope people don't call it a fish tank, but we had to put them in a environmentally sealed compartment, which has its own HVAC system to keep the proper temperature, humidity. Danielle's been working very hard with our operations department and our exhibits department to get the right equipment to maintain that atmosphere in this sealed case that's behind this wall. Um, but it, since it's got to sit in this sealed case, uh, our exhibits department made a really neat little set up for it and i'm not going to ruin it but here's what the parts look like you got to come see this uh this was the ceremony in japan when the japanese officially turned it over to the u.s navy there is the engine and propeller in its un 
uh, clean form and that fragment of wing. They look pretty much still like this, but they've been preserved. They've been cleaned. All the uh, all the foreign con uh, elements and contamination has been removed from them, uh, and they've been coated with a preservative. Uh, but you're going to be able to see these parts in this exhibit and hear the story of this young man. And the story goes on. Uh, the young man, uh, we're still looking for him, his remains. And the family is anxious uh, to hear news, and we may know something next year. That's a continuing story. But come see this exhibit. September 14th, this opens. And... Uh, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to turn it back over to Alicia. All right. So, yeah, definitely come check it out. September 14th is going to be our big grand opening. It is very cool, I have to admit. We snuck in there earlier to take a look at it, and it was very, very neat. Um, so we have just a couple of questions uh, to, to round us out, if that's okay. Um, first of all, um, Bob on YouTube would like to know, how heavy is the Avenger? How heavy is the Avenger? Oh boy, fully loaded. It was almost 18,000 pounds. That would be with all the fuel and with 2,000 pounds of ordnance and, and three crewmen. Very heavy, of course. Um, X Libra. This was, uh, let, me, let me add that this was the heaviest single engine airplane to operate from an aircraft carrier during World War II. The biggest and the heaviest single engine airplane. And it still had a stick. Anything bigger than this, they had wheels. All right. Ex Libris would like to know, how did it compare with the Mitsubishi Zero and why was it called Whistling Death? Uh, uh, what was, which, which airplane was called Whistling Death? I've never heard that attached to the Avenger. Uh, and how it compared to the Zero. The Zero was a fighter plane. It was faster. It was much, much lighter because the Japanese theory of airplanes in the day, and, and you airplane enthusiasts know that, uh, the Japanese did not invest a lot in armor plating or self-sealing fuel tanks. That was just weight they didn't think they needed. They wanted to keep the airplane light and maneuverable. So the Zero was, was deadly uh, because it was light and maneuverable. And that's the big difference. It's different mission. This is a heavier airplane made to carry 2,000 pounds worth of ordnance too. So a very different mission. All right. And your friends, Mike Bell and John from Empire State Science Museum say, hey, hey. guys. <laughs> and they would like to know what is your favorite airplane? Oh, uh, I got in trouble for this answer once before. I said I couldn't pick. I said it'd be easier to pick which one of my three kids and I'm not going to get in that trouble again. But, you know, I always say the Avenger, uh, my first day at Intrepid and I started here in 2005. And I got here really early and there was nobody here, but I was able to walk in and I walked into the hangar deck and there was the Avenger. And uh, my dad passed away within a few weeks of me starting here. And uh, I think I see him sitting on the wing. Wow. That's really touching. Well, everyone. Don't make me cry. Yeah, I know, right? It's going to make me cry. Gosh. Uh, all right. Well, that concludes our program for this evening on that note. Goodness. Thank you so much to, uh, again, our curator of aviation, Eric Bame, and our collections manager, Danielle Swanson, for that amazing tour, um, sharing so many just really cool stories and artifacts with us tonight, too. It was so wonderful to have you both with us um, for this really special experience that we could share with everyone for our 80th anniversary. Um, also, everyone, thank you for tuning in tonight, for joining us, sharing your questions and your comments. If you do have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through any of our social media channels that you are already tuning in through. Uh, as a reminder, our museum is open to the public seven days a week. So if you are in the area, come on by, check out our amazing ship and our amazing planes in person right there on site yourself. Uh, and if you're local, we also invite you actually to come out uh, tomorrow for our free Friday. Uh, it's one of the many that we do throughout the summer. Um, that's Friday the 25th, if you are uh, zooming in uh, after the fact. Um, our museum is going to be open after hours for free from 5 to 9 p.m. So stop on by and see what we have to offer in person. Also, I'm going to throw a little thing up on screen here. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about our ship, we do encourage you to check out our online collections database so you can explore our digital collections about Intrepid and our other artifacts anytime by visiting intrepid.emuseum. Uh, is it .com or .org? Can you ask me real fast? .org. .org. Excellent. Got that right. <laughs> um, and so you can check out the things that we showed tonight, um, some more information about it, some other pictures, and some really interesting things. Also, um, finally, if you did enjoy our broadcast tonight for our special 80th anniversary peek into just one of the many areas of our ship, 
please do consider making a gift to support its preservation and other historic artifacts that are in our care as we continue to honor the past and inspire the future for many years to come. So you can do so by uh, visiting support.intrepidmuseum.org. So once again, everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, thanks for tuning in. And hopefully we will see you on site at the museum sometime soon. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>